My name is Daria Cibrario, I work for PSI, Public Services International, which is the Global Trade Union Federation representing over 30 million public service workers uh, around the world. I have the pleasure of uh, moderating this session uh, this afternoon, um, this session that has been organized by CUPE, the Canadian uh, Union of Public Employees, uh, which is uh, an affiliate uh, uh, to PSI. Here with me today are five distinguished speakers and experts, and I'm going to introduce them in a moment. But uh, before that, let me just uh, describe briefly what is the object of uh, today's discussion. How many of you have, are experts in pension funds or know? Okay, we have one from you, listen, I recognize. Oh, oh. Two, three, and four. I'm sure, well, here we have some experts for sure, I trust. So, very good, but I, just like me, I think it's helpful to, to just briefly introduce the issue before we give the floor to the experts. So, pension funds, including public uh, worker uh, pension funds, have uh, increasingly become a large pool of capital of money which scan the world looking for uh, um, high rates of return to invest in uh, uh, sectors which bring back uh, uh, some profit to their beneficiaries. And so these funds are increasingly uh, investing in public infrastructure because this has emerged as a relatively new class of assets which uh, promises allegedly high returns on investment and a low uh, uh, rate of risk. Now what is public infrastructure? Uh, this relates to both physical infrastructure, such as roads, bridges, um, buildings, uh, but also water pipes, uh, sanitation plants. And on the other hand, we have social infrastructure, everything like hospitals, but also social care, libraries, uh, museums, uh, security and justice. So, in a way, these are uh, the essential infrastructure and public services that make our community thrive and that our businesses and um, um, local economies uh, need to function correctly and to grow. Now, the fact that governments are increasingly stripped of cash uh, at all levels makes it very difficult for them, especially in contexts of austerity, to invest in new uh, public infrastructure or even to maintain it. This means that increasingly pension funds are becoming a vehicle, uh, paradoxically, of privatization of uh, public infrastructure. This creates a really complex uh, configuration whereby you actually have, uh, at times, uh, public uh, uh, workers' set, uh, pension funds which are used to privatize other public sector um, utilities or services in other parts uh, of the world. And in extreme cases, they go as far as to play workers uh, in the same sectors, the public sector or the public services, across national and regional boundaries. So this is uh, uh, a pretty thorny issue that uh, it's uh, uh, today the object of uh, uh, our discussion and debate. And this is why I'm turning to our experts today here to help us disentangle this complexity and uh, uh, better understand how this all works. So I'm gonna ask our experts here today to help us understand and elaborate on how these mechanisms work. We would like also to understand better what is the impact on the ground, possibly with some concrete cases from uh, uh, your realities, from your countries and your experience. Also, how have unions and communities pushed back in, in this case? in case of privatization, uh, you know, conveyed through pension funds. And uh, uh, I would also like to hear from you what are your recommendations to make uh, pension funds uh, uh, not a tool of extraction uh, of profit, but actually a tool, uh, for instance, to finance and fund the Green New Deal or to be a positive conveyor of pro-public uh, policy and why not remunicipalization? So a tough discussion, but I think we have the right people in our panel today to take us um, through that, that debate. 
So let me uh, start introducing uh, our panelists in the order they will uh, make their interventions. First of all, Kevin, Kevin Skerritt. Kevin, you've been a researcher for QP uh, and an expert uh, on pension funds for over 25 years. And you've also recently published a book precisely on this topic called The Contradictions of Pension Fund Capitalism in 2018. We will then uh, have Vera, Vera Wigman, a researcher at CSIRO, which is Public Services International Research Unit. <laughs> you, uh, Vera, are now, uh, by now I would say, very well known in the public service uh, international world for your research on public utilities. And you're also, um, you're of course based at the University of Greenwich near London, and you're a trade union activist for the independent trade union movement. Okay, thank you for that show of hand. We will then move to Stuart, Stuart uh, Fagan, who is a national officer at one of the largest uh, British trade unions, the GMB, and you're in charge of gas distribution and the water sector. We also have with us today Yosi Mayer. Uh, Yosi, you're vice chair and a member of the board of trustees of ABP, which is the largest pension fund in the Netherlands and actually the fifth largest pension fund in the world. Uh, and you've been elected uh, and appointed by the FNV Trade Union to be on that board. And you're also a chair um, of, you're the chair of the Global Unions Committee on Workers' Capital Trustee Leadership Network of the ITUC, which is the International Trade Union Federation. We will then move to the case of, of, of Chile with uh, uh, Fernando, Fernando Toro Cano. Fernando is an architect uh, and a doctor and a PhD. You, uh, Fernando, continue to research in the development planning unit of the UCL, University College of London in the UK. You're also the director of an NGO called the Ciudad Común, our common city, which is a coalition of academia, activists and policy makers who um, push for environmental and social justice and the right to the city. So, having said that, I would start off uh, by giving uh, the floor to uh, Kevin. Since we are five, I would kindly ask you uh, to possibly keep it to uh, a maximum of 10 minutes so that then we will have a, a round of uh, further contributions and enough time to open up uh, for the floor. Thank you very much. Thank you, Darren. And thank you everybody for coming. A quick word of thanks to uh, co-panelists and TNI and the organizers. I'm particularly happy to have this opportunity to, to speak on behalf of QP that did make this uh, issue a priority for the conference. And I'll just say, uh, I think the issue uh, that we're gonna talk about this afternoon is a very important one that does not get discussed very much uh, and because it's an uncomfortable and for some of us, sometimes embarrassing kind of issue, uh, but one that I think is very important that we actually bring into the light and have discussions exactly like this today. Uh, I'll just say very briefly, in addition to what Daria said to introduce me, uh, I have worked on pensions for QP, uh, a large public sector union in Canada. Uh, that has meant that I'm involved in collective bargaining and the fight to protect pension rights for our members, but it has also meant that at times I've played a role as a trustee representing the union on boards of trustees that get involved in investment decision making, investment policy, and all of the difficult challenges that that entails. Uh, and in some ways it was in that role some years ago that, that really I got introduced to these tensions and paradoxes and contradictions that uh, have become, I think, an important subject uh, for this discussion. Just to say, one of the nice things about speaking at this conference is, uh, unlike others that I have spoken to, I don't have to speak uh, this afternoon to those gathered about the importance of the fight around privatization, the importance of public ownership, democratic control. I can take that as a given that we share that view. Uh, I guess I, I would just like to add to that, that um, to get specific about the role of pension plans and pension funds. Are we okay with the sound? Yeah. Uh, the, 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 the contradiction we end up with is that 
you know, a, a trade union like QP, like many others, we spend a lot of our time and energy, quite rightly, uh, interested in defending public uh, ownership and public management because we believe it's good for our members, especially our members that work in public, the public sector, public services, but we also believe it's good for society and good for a democratic society. Uh, and we uh, don't talk enough about the fact that, particularly in the public sector, when we negotiate pension plans, especially in the Anglo-American world, where our pension plans are funded and invested in the private financial markets, this gives us a different connection to the world of privatization, and that is large pension funds, like other institutional investors, have come to view the public sector, public infrastructure in particular, <coughs> as an ideal target for investment. But of course, for it to be a target for private investment, this means it has to be privatized and sometimes transformed and financialized to make it an ideal form of investment. And that's what, that's what we've been seeing. Uh, I will just, <laughs> I'll just, again, as part of the introduction, I just want to uh, point out, uh, David Harvey spoke yesterday and, and gave us a thoughtful uh, uh, keynote. Um, one of the phrases or one of the passages that I have taken from David Harvey that I think is relevant for this contradiction, this paradox, uh, he wrote in, in, a, in a recent book called 17 Contradictions uh, and, the end, and the End of Capitalism. He wrote, uh, I'll just read as, as follows. He talks about an empathy gap between the oligarchy and the global 1% and the rest of us. He says, the empathy gap between the oligarchy and the rest is immense and increasing. The oligarchs mistake superior income for superior knowledge of the world rather than their superior command over accounting tricks and legal niceties. They do not know how to listen to the plight of the world because they cannot and willfully will not confront their role in the construction of that plight. They do not and cannot see their own contradictions. He's talking about the oligarchy, the 1%. I want to I want to agree with Harvey and say this is a contradiction where actually workers through these pension funds actually have a piece of that oligarchy and a piece of the financial markets and the financial system uh, that we are actually up against in our battles. So I want to turn now to the to the gist, and if we could go to the next slide. Uh, I want to talk about what is known in financial market circles on Wall Street and the City of London and other financial circles as the Canadian model of pension fund investment. Uh, this is something that has actually been come to be recognized even by, uh, for example, The Economist magazine. Uh, yeah, uh, it'll come up in a second. In, in the year 2012, The Economist took note of the emergence of a new model that had actually been pioneered by Canadian pension funds in particular. The Australian funds actually ha have a similarity, but the Canadians have a particular model. And really it is a, a group of very large public sector worker pension funds uh, came to uh, develop expertise in the world of infrastructure investing. Uh, and the Canadian model uh, very briefly, is one whereby this is not investing in shares of companies that are privatizing, taking small pieces. The Canadian model is, is a direct ownership or private equity model of ownership of infrastructure, meaning you're not buying a piece, you are buying in, in entire pieces of infrastructure, owning it and operating it on a for-profit basis. Uh, this is this is different, and the expertise and the capacity to do that is actually developed in the Canadian model in-house within the pension fund. It's not that you hire a Wall Street or, or 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 City of London money manager and you send them money and they do it on your behalf. The funds themselves are doing this and and have been pursuing this since the 1990s. Uh, so yes, that's uh, the the Economist magazine in 2012. Uh, took note of this, uh, talked talk about how these Canadian funds are, are making these very large deals, in particular for major pieces of infrastructure in the UK, such as the water companies. Uh, many of the UK water companies are owned by Canadian pension funds. Also airports. The UK's airports and several in Europe 
are owned by Canadian pension funds, and now they're looking around the rest of the world for more. Uh, and The Economist referred to the Canadian funds as the maple revolutionaries. Uh, and in fact, another UK periodical, The Telegraph, uh, in a few years later, reviewed the, the range of an extensive list of recent acquisitions of major pieces of infrastructure uh, by Canadian funds, and they, they, they summarized this, and, they, and then they observed, they say, in the post-crisis, post-financial crisis, new world order, Canada's pension funds have barged onto Wall Street to stake a claim to be the new masters of the universe. <laughs> so dramatic language. So I want to talk a bit about who these funds are and what, what, what they're actually doing, what it actually means, as, as Daria said. Okay. Uh, so the Canadian funds, uh, we talk a lot about the big 10 Canadian funds, and, and I've just put the logos on for the, for the big 10 funds. Some of you may recognize a couple of the names. Ontario Teachers is very famous. Omers, perhaps. QP represents municipal workers in Canada, including in Ontario. That's a municipal and school board workers fund. There's a couple of the top right there. Canada Pension Plan Investment Board and Caisse de Dépôt et Placement. These are actually uh, public pensions that all workers participate in. It's not just occupational. Anyway, those are th that's the list of the top 10 all told, there's more than a trillion dollars Canadian, actually more than a trillion U.S., uh, invested by these 10 funds. If I could go to the next slide. Uh, just to underline the point about the presence and the importance of these funds in the world of private or <coughs> privatized uh, public infrastructure, this is an amazing list published by Prakin, which is one of the uh, data companies that tracks financial markets. This is a list of the top 10 institutional investors in, their, in the order of their allocation to infrastructure. I'll talk about which infrastructure in a second, but this is a list of the big funds and how much they've allocated, measured in billions US, uh, to infrastructure as a category. And of course you'll notice what's remarkable about this list of 10, six of the 10 are Canadian. And, uh, of course, notice one is Australian. I mentioned Australia. And, of course, the Netherlands are represented in, the, in two of the others. The only other one is Japan. And I confess I actually don't know very much about that Japanese fund. I'm not sure what kind of infrastructure they invest in. But I do know about what the Canadian funds invest in. And that's what I want to just say a, a couple of words about. What are we talking about in terms of infrastructure? What is this category? Daria gave a short list. I, I want to kind of go over a, a slightly longer list. What these funds really want and are looking for and have been acquiring includes energy and electricity of all types, generation, transmission, renewable, so-called. Uh, it also means water, transportation of all types, railways, toll highways, bridges, airports as a form of transportation. And then also more of what we think of as social infrastructure, hospitals, long-term care, uh, housing of all types, student housing, seniors housing, public housing. Schools and universities are being privatized or owned and managed and operated privately for profit. Postal services are on the list. Prisons. And also remarkably, I hope I get a chance to say this maybe later, uh, the Ontario Teachers Pension Plan recently, uh, some years ago, uh, started buying up private for-profit childcare chains starting in the UK, now building childcare in Canada. Uh, these are the pension funds of teachers that in Canada campaign against private for-profit childcare and for public, unionized, regulated, not-for-profit childcare. I won't go over all the reasons why these pieces of infrastructure are so attractive to these funds. Uh, I'll just say in, in a line, uh, I think this is one of the themes of the conference. The privatizers are finding these are good deals. They, they cut marvelous deals with governments, often public sector authorities, uh, to acquire what is virtual monopoly control in many cases, where they can set prices. Uh, they're long-term deals, sometimes 30 years or more. And often they are structured to virtually guarantee profits for the private investors. It's a very attractive model uh, for all the reasons you can imagine if you're a pension fund investor. 
Let me switch to the next slide and, and say a quick word to get even more specific and concrete, and that's partly what my co-panelists will, will get into. I want to say a, a couple of quick words about Chile. The two most popular destinations for Canadian pension fund investment are, of course, the two countries famous for going furthest with neoliberal reform and restructuring. That's Chile, started under Pinochet, and of course the UK, uh, which was really launched under Margaret Thatcher, so famously. Uh, I won't, I'll, I'll leave it to Stuart and others to talk about the UK more, but in Chile, just to say uh, what this notes is some, some of these pension funds uh, have particularly located uh, investments in the water uh, companies that were privatized in Chile. Uh, in Santiago and other parts of Chile, most of their privatized water system is now owned by Canadian pension funds. Uh, and, and in fact, it is the Ontario Teachers Pension Pension Fund. The teachers' unions, of course, in Canada, uh, argue strenuously against water privatization. Water privatization would not be acceptable in Canada. But of course, in other countries, when it happens, it's a, it's a profit opportunity. I, I can't help but note, and I, and I included this photo, because the movement in Chile uh, that has exploded in recent weeks, and I want to offer my solidarity with that movement. It's a mass movement against neoliberalism. Uh, it's a movement in particular to recover public social control over their water system and their pension system, which was massively pri privatized. So in many ways, this, this should be putting us, I would say the Canadian labor movement, Canadian pension plan activists, pension rights activists, in contact with this, these Chilean movements. We should be finding ways to operate in solidarity, uh, but that is yet to be done. I just have a couple of last slides. I appreciate, uh, I'm, I'm running out of time, but I, I want to make this one last point, which is quite important. It's not just that uh, these investments uh, are individually troubling and, and we can pick out certain uh, examples like Chile. I want to make an argument that these funds are becoming politically organized. Uh, against, directly against our interests and our efforts to defend uh, against privatization and to recover public ownership, public control. In Toronto in 2015, my understanding, a group of these Canadian pension funds established a new organization called the Global Infrastructure Investors Association, GIIA, which is essentially a lobby organization, a political organization, to get involved in policy setting at the national and international level, OECD, G20, international bodies. Uh, and sorry, if you could just back up, Bobby, and just, just, just take note of the, the, the logos represented by this association. It includes, of course, all of those big 10, the big Dutch funds, the Australian funds are there, and also, of course, you know, your friendly neighborhood, Goldman Sachs, JP Morgan, KPMG, all of these players that we have contact with in our fights against privatization. This is like a coalition, a pro-privatization coalition that our pension funds are deeply implicated in, quietly operating in alongside these big investment banks, I would argue, against our interest. And if, Bobby, you go to the next one, this is the, 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 the main page of the website of the GIIA. What is their mandate, of course? Promoting private investment in infrastructure. Uh, this is the membership body of the world's leading institutional investors on their behalf we work with governments and other stakeholders to boost the role of private investment in providing infrastructure. Uh, and just, uh, I'll wrap with this. I appreciate I'm, I've run out of time. Maybe I can get back to a couple of other points afterwards. But just last point about the political role of these funds. And if we could go to just maybe make this the last slide. Uh, along with this quiet role through organizations like the GIIA, uh, private investors and finance, uh, financial asset managers will even now get directly involved in politics. Uh, I think we all, uh, many of us in the room are familiar with this important, uh, these important developments in the UK where Corbyn and the Labour Party are proposing major recovery, renationalization, retaking democratic control over water, over energy, over postal services, rail services, so many things. Well, there has been actually an active effort in the UK to warn people against supporting this movement, arguing in part that, well, you know, your pensions 
are now so wrapped up in the, in the profits generated by these privatized industries that your pension is under threat if Corbyn forms a government. And this, met, this resonates. This will be effective. This is, and maybe I'll stop here. This is one of the key reasons that I think for those, especially those of us in the labor movement, we have to learn how to grapple with this and come to terms with this. Because uh, as it stands, we're not preparing our own members, we're not preparing workers and communities for exactly these kinds of arguments. And maybe I'll stop there uh, and we'll hear from others. <laughs> Thank you, Debbie. Yeah, sorry for putting pressure. This is a, a very, very uh, necessary and uh, uh, highly um, illuminating introduction to, to the theme and all its contradictions. So um, just to uh, switch to Vera, uh, Kevin has uh, uh, mentioned very clearly how uh, Canadian pension funds uh, with the Canadian model of uh, uh, pension fund investment have uh, uh, gone uh, uh, massively in the UK and Chile. And so Vera is precisely going to tell us more about how that uh, pension fund investment uh, in uh, water and other utilities in the UK looks like and, uh, and draw some, uh, um, some conclusions and analysis from that. Vera. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, yeah, I, I, thank you for your really great presentation, actually. I think it's a very nice uh, way to, for me to start where you left the debate exactly of the pensions and what it means. So as you all probably know by now, uh, we have an election coming up uh, uh, very soon in the UK. And um, it is a big, a big topic is the nationalization of uh, well, many key industries, but also water and electricity. And uh, what I will be presenting here is um, the pension funds involvement and uh, what it means for compensation if these nationalizations would go ahead, which we of course all hope for, fingers crossed, and into the fight. Um, I'm presenting this paper, um, which is very much a brainchild, I should say, of uh, my colleague David Hall, and uh, so I'm presenting this joint paper by us. And so I'm gonna skip that because you all know by now who Cyro is. So uh, yes, yeah, so let's let's start where you left it with this whole idea that pensioners will pay the price for nationalisation. Like we just saw this uh, really great pic, uh, picture there, and um, the chamber, um, uh, well, CBI, uh, basically, that, which is like the British industry affiliation, the big, uh, like that's maybe how I can say it in, sh in, in short, made this big claim that the compensation for nationalization of water and energy would be eye-watering, it would be so high. They said it's nearly 2 billion, for, so 1.96 billion. I put the link in there to the slide to where they mentioned it. And they said that um, pensioners will pay the price. Uh, that's, that's what the, I copied it from the website, so under Labour's uh, plans, uh, savers and pensioners could suffer an estimated 9 billion loss uh, to the holdings, which translates into 327 for every household in the country. Whoa, big scaremongering here going on. So what is the conclusion they're drawing from it? The conclusion basically is it, is it then that compensation, if we nationalize these industry, should be high, right? So that the workers don't lose out. Um, so and this is exactly where we should uh, engage with, with the debate. So uh, we... Um, we toyed with uh, the claim from, from the CBI, obviously they say two, 200 billion, and we came up with a very different figure. Uh, we, we think it's not even uh, 80 billion, so massive difference, uh, less than half. Uh, why, why? I mean, we actually think that the figure is even lower, uh, but just to, um, I don't want to bore you too much with figures here, but just very, very briefly, what did they get wrong? The first big mistake they made uh, was that they included the debt. So for example, when water went from public ownership into private ownership back then, it was debt free. There was no debt. So now they're adding the debt on this. So completely wrong calculation. Uh, then the other big uh, financial error they made is that they added the 30% takeholder, uh, takeover premium, um, which it doesn't uh, actually, um, uh, it, well, it's this specific regulation, the stock market regulation, which doesn't apply to nationalization, and they also now adjusted their figure and took the 30% off, uh, so completely wrong figure. Um, but then also what uh, is important to mention when we talk about compensation is that compensation is actually um, uh, negotiated, it is set in Parliament. Uh, so yes, of course, it, it's based on figures, but the decision 
will be made in, in Parliament. With specifically, it's mentioned that it needs Parliament needs to decide within the public interest. So, uh, is there power in the pension plan? So, this is the question, and um, we can say that um, the fourth and seventh. So, this is the green as you the light lighter green as foreign pen, pension funds, and the darker green as UK uh, pension funds. But we can say that. Um, the shareholders, uh, the fourth and the seventh largest one in water, this is water, sorry, um, uh, are Canadian pension funds. And in electricity, it's, it doesn't look a lot. It's only 2% of, of two pension funds that each have 2%. But if you look at it in more detail, you can see that these two pension funds, it's, it translates into 25% of them each have... Um, a share in Scottish and Southern Gas Distribution Network. So, uh, in that sense, th th there is some power there. So the question, and as a researcher, I think it's better to ask the question, you know, is, is there power? Do, you, do unions maybe have leverage over that? Is there something we, we, can, we can do about that, you know, that uh, uh, investing in other people's prioritization, uh, can we put a stop to that? Can we put a, a, evolution, in, a revolution into this? So just really uh, quickly, would workers lose out? Uh, our analysis is no, they would not lose out. Why? Simply just because this is a, for the UK figures. Um, obviously, we're talking about pension funds at, as a whole, and this is, uh, would only represent 1.7% of the overall pension funds. This is what uh, for water and energy together. So basically, of course, it's all about sharing the risks. So if, if, uh, if it's about sharing the risk between the pension funds, it's actually not that much. So the, uh, the, the workers would not lose out. It would be minimal for them. And in, in terms of uh, foreign pension funds, it's um, also minimal, but not a bit more. Um, but by nationalizing water and energy, and that's obviously the key message to make, is that it's not only that the pensioners would not, not lose out, but that everyone would benefit, and every household would benefit. So the calculation here is that um, annual household savings would be made um, 6.2 billion every year, so it's uh, 2.5 billion for water and 3.7 billion for energy, and which is basically an average of uh, 255 per year uh, per household. So everyone would be better off, so let's calculate one against the other. Uh, conclusion, I think that's the first presentation I mentioned to be on time here today. Um, uh, so yeah, the compensation costs are massively inflated, uh, so we should, uh, we should talk up, look at these figures um, uh, in, in, well, in detail and see that we don't buy all the arguments they throw, throw at us. Um, ultimately, it's, it's Parliament anyway who decides the compensation. Um, we can say that the UK pension funds Pension funds would only be marginally uh, um, affected, foreign a bit more, but also also marginally. Uh, the pensioners would not uh, lose out, um, uh, and uh, everyone would benefit from nationalisation. But I think the key message here, especially for our Canadian uh, audience, is don't mess with other people's privatisation. So you know, uh, don't invest there. Like, and uh, if there is some power in the union, that would be great. time and you've also been very clear, concise and delivering very important messages. I really like this uh, formulation uh, as public pension investment in other countries' privatization. It's uh, very strong and powerful. But So we've started with Kevin uh, as with uh, the Canadian pension funds, uh, with the Canadian model of uh, pension fund investment. We've looked at uh, the UK, how uh, these funds play an important role uh, in uh, um, British uh, uh, critical utility services uh, and the fact that actually it is not a thing, quite the contrary, to think about uh, uh, nationalization and that yes, it is economically not only um, uh, viable, but it is actually, we should wish uh, that it goes through, so uh, we all uh, are with you uh, on the 12th, uh, on the right side of course, and now we are actually going, uh, still staying with the uh, UK, but uh, uh, so um, Kevin, you mentioned uh, the investments that go across uh, uh, the Atlantic and land, uh, as, as we've heard, uh, for instance, in, in a number of the privatized water utilities in the UK. 
So uh, I read uh, a steward about uh, the fight that the GMB uh, has been involved in, uh, involved in uh, concerning Thames Water, which is one of the key uh, water companies in the UK and certainly the company which provides water to uh, London. And uh, the amazing thing is precisely that uh, when uh, uh, these pension funds uh, uh, go abroad, uh, well, the companies they invest in, they behave uh, exactly as uh, uh, the horrendous uh, uh, vulture um, funds or um, finance or private equity companies or bad employers squeezing the workers, undermining collective bargaining at the other side uh, of, uh, at the other end uh, of, the, of the spectrum. So uh, the GMB launched the, the uh, Bring uh, Back the Top campaign and uh, we would like to hear a little bit uh, about this amazing um, story and how uh, the workers across the oceans have uh, uh, organized themselves to fight back. Thank you, Daria. Uh, thank you, Kevin, Vera, uh, Stuart Fagan, National Officer for the GMB. I look after all of our members nationally in the water sector, but also I also have responsibility for our members in the gas sector, and there's actually many synergies between water and gas. If I may, I'll give you a very quick and biased view of the water sector in the UK over the last 30 years. 1989, 6th of July, the Water Act was passed by the Thatcher government, which put the water sector, the 11 water boards that we had in private ownership, into private hands. Fast forward 30 years later, the current water sector in the UK wastes 2.4 billion litres of treated water every day as treated water. Bearing in mind that the UK, if you've had the, the, the pleasure of either visiting the UK or living in the UK, like Vera and myself, you'll know that the UK is a fairly wet country, <laughs> and we only actually use 2% of the water that falls out of the sky for our domestic and commercial use. But we waste 2.4 billion litres of water. In the same time, customers' bills have increased by 40% over the retail price of inflation. So that's in real terms, there's been a 40% increase to water customers. During that time, in fact today, the average salary for a CEO of one of the 17 privatised water companies in the UK is £1.2 million a year. That's currently roughly about seven to eight times the salary of the UK Prime Minister. Also, between the, uh, the years of 2013 and 2017, UK privatised water companies pay £6.5 billion pounds to its private shareholders. So this is essentially a natural monopoly uh, that was in public hands, that's been put into private ownership, that's now wasting 2.4 billion litres of water every day, paying its CEOs way, way above um, you know, even what the UK Prime Minister earns, and also providing a fairly poor service to customers. As you know, in the UK, because it's a natural monopoly, water customers, for example, in London, as you mentioned, Daria, don't have a choice over who they receive their water from. They can't go to the tap and say, I'm going to have a bit of Yorkshire water today or a bit of Thames water. They just get hot and cold, as you, as you know. So if I may, I, I think what you'd like me to do is probably focus a bit on our campaign with Thames water. So again, just to, uh, for those of you who don't know, Thames Water is the largest regional water company in the UK. As Darren mentioned, it pretty much services the whole of London, plus the uh, you know, other parts of Greater London as well. And uh, it is a company which, whose major shareholder, principal shareholder, is Omeris, as, uh, as Kevin's uh, mentioned. And, and that has actually proved very helpful to us actually in many ways you know, in a very bizarre way um, but when the actual company came to us in 2017 September 2017 and told us, advised us that they were going to start a formal consultation with the trade union to close its two defined benefit pension schemes one of which is referred to as the mirror image scheme, essentially a pension scheme that was set up when the, when the sector was privatised uh, which was essentially to mirror the pension arrangements for those in the public sector at the time. And also the Temp Water uh, scheme, which is essentially a scheme that's been set up since then, 
both of which are defined benefits. So essentially, in my very simple pension speak, I'm not a pension expert at all. Uh, our members know exactly what they're paying, what they're going to get, uh, and when they're going to get it, essentially. <laughs> Uh, and the company uh, said we can't afford either of those two schemes and started in the UK under pensions regulations, what we call the Pension Act, a 60 day consultation to close both those schemes. Now, in many ways, when there's challenges, there's also opportunities. And one of the things that um, I think it's um, certainly consistent to me in my 20 plus years of being a trade union official is the one thing that unites workers at any uh, employer is when you start messing with their pension arrangements. Um, uh, obviously, because essentially you're, you're, you're selling what people's future, effectively, you know, their future. When they are unable to work anymore or can't work anymore, this is essentially you know, the money, the deferred pay that's put aside for them in, in their retirement. So, um, so we mounted a campaign, uh, and I have to say, Dara, at this stage, I'm very uh, grateful for the invitation to be here, but I feel slightly full because it wasn't just myself and colleagues in the GMB. I also have to mention our sister trade unions, Unison, and also Unite, and uh, particularly, if I may, just to name check a couple of people, Colin Meach, who I know Kevin knows very well, was incredibly influential, and Alan Fox, who's a pension officer for Unison, as well as my colleagues in Unite as well. Uh, we, we mounted a campaign which largely was essentially tried to inflict some reputational damage on Thames Water, which was, as Thames Water, you're owned by, essentially, in our world, what is a defined benefit pension scheme in Omeries, but you're proposing to close the defined benefit pension scheme of those people that work for Thames Water. Now, one thing that's obviously uh, very helpful, and again, uh, when you went I mean, probably spoken at many trade union events and I have to, I'll be honest with you, sometimes you come away feeling thoroughly depressed about the future, but if I give you one bit of hope to everybody in this room, um, is one thing that we all know that these pension schemes do not like is they are absolutely terrified of any reputational damage. Uh, they do not like, they don't necessarily fearful of striking workers, but they are absolutely fearful of their public perception by governments, regulators and also the wider financial world. So we made it very clear to Thames that if they did back down from their plans, we would be mounting a very clear campaign based upon reputational damage to Thames Water, to their shareholders. And this is where I have to really name check uh, Colin Meach. I know Colin worked closely with Kevin and other colleagues to build a campaign behind the scenes that the company knew exactly what we were up to. Um, to say, if you, don't, if you don't back off from this proposal, that's exactly what we would do. Are pleased to say that the company have currently withdrawn uh, their proposals to close both of their pension schemes. However, we are now into what we call the actuarial evaluation of those schemes. Is a, a, a cycle, which you're probably aware, comes around every three years in the UK under, under pensions law. And obviously, so we've won a battle, but the war is going to be now making sure that we can keep those two pension schemes open and most importantly, affordable to our members. Um, just a just an interesting point. I think uh, Kevin and Vera both made actually. One of the challenges we find, particularly with our our campaign, which we uh, we call Take Back the Tap, and that is many of our actual members actually have share options in pension schemes. So where the if you like the propaganda wars come in relation to the point that Vera is making about the cost of renationalising water industries, where we've actually had the most challenge for our members is them saying to us, well, what's going to happen to my share options? Yeah, yeah, yeah well, I, you know, this is part of my, my employment package, this is part of my earnings. Um, I'm old enough, uh, fortunately, to remember, I still, I still am a member of the cooperative uh, movement in the UK. Um, I have a dividend card, and every year I get a dividend paid to me by the cooperative, because essentially, I suppose, for a better expression, a profit share arrangement. Uh, but also it's publicly owned, it's owned by the members and it's, it's democratically owned, controlled by the members. And so we've spent an awful lot of time actually quite, quite, you know, quite unashamedly trying to educate our members that you know, pro, you know, there was a time before privatisation when water companies were democratically controlled, that the, the fruits of the labour, if I can use that expression, were shared equally amongst um, the members where we had decent, good pension schemes. In fact, uh, there's been also a lot of discussion with the uh, with the, uh, the Labour Party in formulating the policy to renationalise the water sector, 
um, which uh, I know uh, the conference this week's heard from uh, Professor David Hall, a uh, colleague of Vera, uh, who's been very influential in that discussion, and uh, thank him for his work on that. Well, well we, we've actually uh, been uh, convincing our members that actually there was a time before the industry was privatised and actually the t that time was pretty good, both in terms of pensions, in terms of earnings levels, in terms of democratic control in the industry and in terms of satisfaction to customers. So, um, so we will find out next Thursday. Uh, as you know, the, uh, the, the general election is held on the 12th of uh, December in the UK and, and obviously following on from that, hopefully... Uh, with a Labour majority, we'll see that programme be put into practice. Thank you, Stuart, for telling us more about this exciting campaign, which indeed has been uh, supported by all the major um, um, all the major trade unions in the UK, and uh, and also for telling us really about the, the concrete uh, consequences of this kind of investment uh, on uh, the pension funds of uh, UK um, workers actually. So uh, now let's move uh, uh, to the Netherlands with uh, Yosi. So we've heard about the Canadian model of uh, pension fund investment. We've uh, gone through the UK and the effects and uh, how uh, communities and unions are pushing back. Now uh, it would be really interesting to hear uh, from you Yosi about uh, perhaps is there a uh, Dutch model of pension fund investment, or how are you coming to grips with this kind of uh, contradictions in uh, such a big pension fund uh, like yours? Um, what is uh, uh, your your analysis and, and your approach to, to this complexity? Uh, thank you. Uh, it, it, I really enjoy being here and just uh, be able to tell a little bit about the, the Dutch approach. I don't know if there is a Dutch approach. But I really, I do represent a Dutch uh, pension fund, so uh, that makes it okay. And I wonder, when I was uh, hearing to you all, I, I figured, do I have to feel guilty? Do I have to feel guilty? What has my pension uh, fund has been doing lately? Uh, is it all okay? Uh, I, we were, APT was in uh, Thameswater, but they left there. They're not anymore in Thameswater, and that's... And I mean, that's not the start of the Dutch uh, uh, approach, but um, it is um, the the why we uh, left, uh, not why we left uh, Thames Water, but the, the the moment we left uh, uh, Thames Water was really because they have been as we were asking questions, and I think that's the Dutch approach. Uh, um, if I look at ABB, which is a, which, it's a huge fund. And we are. I'm very happy to be in a Dutch fund, and we because we have a Dutch governance in our fund, and in way and in that way, uh, so workers are also uh, uh, have their place within the fund. And uh, I heard you say that they have their place also in the Canadian fund. Um, but then I figured, well, how come that? Um, the workers or the workers' influence does not let the money make for workers. Uh, that, that's the slogan that we use at the CWC, the Committee on Workers' Capital, let's workers' money work for workers. And that's really a way of thinking that I really enjoy very much, and I think it's very necessary to have that in your mind when you are on a pension fund, uh, that you have to make workers' money, because pensions, and the money we invest, and for the ABP that's about 500 billion uh, dollars uh, that we invest, and, and then in that way, uh, we really, that's workers' money, and we have to be, and we want to be accountable as a fund of, of what we do with that money. And I think that's the Dutch approach. Um, and with ABP, uh, we have, uh, maybe a little bit more of a Dutch approach. Uh, like uh, the Netherlands used to have the, um, we were known as, uh, as the figure, or we always had this uh, uh, to say what the world should do. Uh, uh, well, that's a long time ago in, in uh, politics in the Netherlands, but uh, ABP has kind of a <laughs> way of doing this. We want to show 
the world what we should do as pension funds. So we want to be a front runner on uh, responsible investing. That doesn't mean that we don't make we don't we do make mistakes. You always make mistakes when you uh, invest that much of mon that much money. But there is a, a, a very big commitment of the board to that let workers' money work for workers, although the employers say it in a different way, but the effect is the same. Um, uh, and we feel very much committed to the case that we have to uh, act responsibly. And ABP has been formulating a very, uh, a very uh, comprehensive uh, responsible investment policy since uh, and we started in 2008, but uh, we, uh, the, the, the real change uh, started in 2015, and now we are uh, focusing on our next five-year plan, 2020 to 2025. Um, so in that way, we um, what's the what's uh, not only our policy is uh, responsible. But we want to have our asset manager, which is APG, accountable for what they do. So they have to be transparent. We want to know what they are doing. We, we, we choose the policy, and they have to perform. And um, we, want, we want them to perform uh, responsibly. And we, we tell uh, APG also, it's not only the high returns that count. Uh, we want, and our pensioners say that to all, us also, uh, we want good, good pensions, that, that way there we are for, to uh, uh, invest our money in such a way that we uh, get them uh, good pensions. So our pensioners want us to give them good pensions, but they also say, we want to have a good pension, <coughs> and I'm not going into the Dutch uh, pol political uh, debate on what a good pension is, but our pensioners want uh, say they want a good pension, but they wanted to have it in a livable world. And a livable world is not only the E of the environment or the climate, it's not only the G of the governance, and, uh, and not too extreme uh, paying of uh, the board or, or whatever, but it's also about the S, the, the social, social justice, not only for people, but also for workers, and uh, that's um, what we expect uh, that APG puts in their um, policy and in their performing, and we get back uh, from them. We, we listen in our policy very much to our beneficiaries. We talk a lot about with NGOs, and we talk a lot within our board. What are we moving in the right direction? And um, in that way, I am proud to be a member of the board of ABP and be, re be a front runner on the responsible investing way. And um, well, there's, not, there's always a lot of work to do. Uh, and we uh, say for the next five years, we really should more, put more pressure on the S factor of our uh, investments. Uh, how can we uh, put that more uh, into, uh, into view of our asset manager? Uh, but I think uh, we are doing. Uh, I think we are doing our utmost to uh, give that, give our beneficiaries good pensions in a responsible way. And uh, when it, one, uh, when if our asset manager goes wrong or does something wrong, we really want uh, people, whatever, because we are a global investor. Uh, I'm the one within the board that got. I got an awful lot of questions. People always mail me, uh, do you know what's going on? So in that way, is uh, listen to the beneficiaries, make a good policy, and in that way you have, and uh, uh, we'll come back that, to that later, I hope. Uh, it's a very good way of, um, uh, I, I talked to you last night, about really giving workers influence in the board. That's what it's about, and then you get a worker's policy. Also. Thank you, Josie. Uh, you talked about the role of, uh, of uh, governance of, uh, in, uh, in uh, making uh, the use of funds uh, sustainable and uh, after um, 
we hear from Fernando will open up uh, uh, briefly to uh, ask uh, about your recommendations to fix or to improve, if not solve, uh, for the future this kind of situation and this kind of uh, internal contradiction of this fund. So, uh, Josie, I anticipate the question from you. I think it would be really helpful to hear what are then the investment guidelines that you abide uh, by in, uh, in ADP and also, for instance, you mentioned that uh, uh, you disinvested from Tam's water and how was that possible? How was, uh, uh, what was the process that led to that? Mm -hmm. But before we, we get there, uh, let's uh, move on to Chile with Fernan uh, Fernando now. So we've uh, gone through uh, a number of countries and again, it is uh, uh, Canadian pension funds, uh, as uh, Kevin has said, uh, which have invested heavily, uh, including in, in Chile, taking advantage of uh, the neoliberal policies that since the 70s were imposed uh, and pushed uh, through a uh, violent uh, uh, dictatorship. Um, and so, uh, Fernando, tell us what is the impact on the ground and on the people of this kind of uh, quite predatory investment, if uh, we can call it that way, and what is uh, uh, the connection to uh, what is happening right now in Chile? Thank you. Under this regime, uh, Augusto Pinochet, which is the uh, middle right uh, person, uh, was supported by a group of intellectuals coming back from the Chicago school after studying the, the ideas of Milton Friedman. The so-called uh, Chicago Boys designed the constitution that uh, continues until today. The main objective of it, uh, as the slides uh, show, it was to liberalize the economy and privatize and deregulate the public structure in different dimensions to allow uh, a private and transnational investment to profit with, with public companies and resources. In that sense, not only some fundamental resources like water uh, were privatized, uh, but also social rights as education, health, and social security. Um, the, the urban land, uh, which is one of my uh, expertise, was also deregulated to give free action to the private companies to develop their business. Um, that is one that we are going to see later. In terms of the pension funds, uh, that's a, a newspaper 20 years ago that says that Chileans were going to retire with the 100% of their income in the next year, in one month. But the reality is not that. Um, the new constitution created in 1980 introduced an individual uh, pension system through a private pension funds administrator that we call AFP or AFP. Uh, so um, they are responsible for managing the savings of all the workers in Chile uh, and this radical change of the pension funds towards an entirely individual one without solidarity components was carried out under the supervision of the then uh, Ministry of Labor, uh, the economist Jose Piñera. Uh, who is Jose Piñera? The brother of the current president of Chile. Uh, as has been raised uh, one more than one occasion by various actors, the AFP system was created rather than a social security system as a way to facilitate the accumulation of capital and consolidate the market of Chilean capitals. As we can see uh, in the slide, what was announced as a miracle and was exported to other countries across Latin America and the world is in reality the precarity of hundreds of thousands of retired Chileans uh, and half of them uh, Oh, in this new system, receive less than 68 US dollars a month. So that's the 100% that they were, the economists were talking about. Uh, this is, uh, this is our, these are the consequences. This is the movement that uh, Kevin was talking about, no more AFP, uh, because people is tired of being amused from multiple perspectives. Uh, the social security is, very fun is, fun is a fundamental one. Um, early this year, an old retired couple was found dead on their house. They left a letter where they declared that they took the decision to die because they were tired of living at the expenses of their families and neighbors. 90% of the retired Chileans receive a basic pension of less than 200 US dollars. That picture was taken this year. But for uh, but. 
not not uh, but it is clearly accumulation but this possession model is not bad for everyone obviously there are someone that is winning according to the superintendents the accumulation of assets for the first time exceeded the 200,000 million dollar on 2017 uh, reaching 250 million uh, on March uh, 2018. This means the 79 of the national GDP. So it's a big source of capital. Um, 56 of the resources are invested in the national market and 43 in the international one. Uh, in, the, in the Chilean market, this capital is distributed among uh, variable income instruments such as shares, stocks, and investment funds, and fixed income ones. Uh, debt government, long-term deposits, bank bonds, uh, mutual and investment funds, corporate bonds, and mortgages, and so on. Um, infrastructure. Although, uh, until last year, the regulations did not allow AFP, uh, to AFP to invest directly in the real estate sector, the use of the, this different instrument that I just talked about has historically contributed directly and directly to the financing of uh, residential, commercial, and industrial real estate development. It considers both uh, financing the demand and the offer. Uh, in terms of the offer, it contributes through three main mechanisms. First, investment in shares, bonds, and notes of construction and real estate development companies, in addition to those companies that have real estate uh, development as a secondary area of business, especially retail companies. Second, mutual and investment funds participation of uh, construction and real estate companies, as you can see in the higher uh, line, where workers put the 10% of their savings in, in the private pension funds and they participate as shareholders in investment funds that are developing these buildings or uh, different infrastructure. And the other way, it's a, a, through the concession system uh, where the state uh, gives the the ownership of a land, of a territory or service to some companies, transnational mainly, to build, operate, and transfer for 30 or 40 years. So they also participate in those uh, operations to build, uh, like Kevin says, uh, energy, hospital, prisons, highways, and so on. In terms of housing, um, this additional liquidity proportionate, proportionate by the AFP investment on the financial system have different consequences in, in terms of the territory. As you can see in the first graph, um, the, in the last years, the, the amount of houses built uh, by this uh, system has been increasingly um, growing through the time. And there are also uh, another uh, international uh, investment or financial institution uh, that are planning to come to Chile because of the, uh, the regulation that we have. These are uh, some of the consequences in, in terms of the uh, territorial um, impact. Uh, in, the, in the left side, we have the map of Santiago, a city of 7 million people. Um, and the blue color is the, the highest uh, so, so socioeconomic groups, and the red one are uh, what we understand like slums or something like that. In terms of the uh, Human Development Index, the, the, the blue one is similar to, to Norway, and the red one is similar to Congo. So in uh, about 20 kilometers, we have these differences. The other uh, dimension that I, I could tell you is about the, housing, uh, the indicator that relates the housing prices and the income. So you can know if you can buy a house. So Chile uh, is the leader of this graph, where is New Zealand, Australia, UK, Canada, and the most neoliberal countries, where it's almost impossible for a Chilean person to buy a house today. Uh, this is a picture also took this year uh, where uh, housing and pension movements and together Ucamao is one of the biggest uh, housing movements. This is in the same place that Kevin showed us the last picture, but are, it's another demonstration. And the no more AFP is with the housing movements. Um, to finish, and um, very far to diminish, um, I want to show these uh, two interviews given to by two supporters of the actual system. While one, uh, the the left uh, the, the left one, 
um, is calling for a more, uh, an even more influence of, of pension funds on infrastructure. The other one, that is the Minister of Finance, is commenting on the idea to transform Chile in, into a, the new world-class financial center in Latin America, uh, giving the examples of Hong Kong and Singapore. This was in London in September this year in the Mining Day, where the, the CEO, the politicians of Chile, related to financial issues, comes to London to build new reforms with the, um, the, the mining companies and so on. Uh, yeah, finish. <laughs> uh, yeah, and yeah, that's all I think. This uh, was this was before the the social and political crisis in Chile. Nowadays, um, where environment, pension funds, and, and housing are at the core of the demand. So we're gonna see what happens next year. Thank you. I think you really showed very well the, the, the human tragedy. I mean, this is, it looks abstract, it looks like uh, some uh, money in the air, but it has some very concrete uh, human consequences on people, on community. The gentrification and the uh, social urban segregation that you've uh, showed are, uh, uh, are really a, a ticking bomb that has exploded, and we've seen that. And, and so uh, this is really something that uh, relates uh, to, to the discussion about our uh, future is public because this is uh, uh, one of those things that uh, the, the, the concepts and the vision that is being discussed these days uh, here is precisely about uh, uh, changing this kind of uh, uh, situations and making them better and, and bringing back to people uh, uh, cities where to live, uh, not where to invest. Now, we have uh, a relatively uh, short time, so I'm going to do one thing, if you allow. First of all, I ask all our speakers to uh, think about two lines uh, to tell me uh, what is their recommendation on this point. We've heard uh, this uh, motto, let's uh, workers' money uh, work for workers and for the people. So I would like each of you panelists to tell me in a nutshell uh, what is your key or one or two key recommendations to change the situation and make uh, these huge pension funds, so these huge uh, money pools of money to work for pro-public policies and for a future that is public, not for private extraction. So this is the first point I will ask you to answer, and then I will collect a few questions from the floor, and so please take note of these uh, uh, questions if they, are, if they target you specifically. So, I've seen John, then, okay, one, two, three, four, five. I won't take more for now, so John, uh, can you please? Yeah. Uh, John Richards, I'm from Unison. Uh, I think you have to come oh, here, how does it work? Uh, let me see. Okay. So I'm John Richards from uh, Unison in the United Kingdom and my colleague, you mentioned Colin Leach, uh, I managed him for a long time. Um, I just want to say as well as some of the things we've raised, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, and, um, and I'm also Vice Chair of the Local Government Pension Fund which is one of the large, it's the largest one in the UK. But I, the, the challenge we're also facing on top of this, I don't want to add to the challenges, is the amount of money that the pension fund managers take out of it, out of the process, and how many, much of hidden costs, and ADP have done a lot of work on this, but I think it's something that we need to know as pension fund governors, is how much hidden money that the actual fund managers take out for the transitions as you do the work. We did one fund in the West Midlands, uh, they thought they were paying 10 million pounds, when they did the analysis, they were paying 90 million pounds was being paid, so nine times as much in hidden costs. So I just think I just wanted to throw that in as well. Thank you. I've just been told that uh, there's a prayer that is going to take place at 3:30, so I'm uh, even more stressed. So please be concise with your uh, questions, uh, and uh, also panelists, please be concise with your answers. Yeah, thank you very much. I'm Constantine. I actually work at the university there, and my pensions are invested in ABP, and I don't really appreciate the fact that you talk about responsible investment but don't divest from fossil fuels. Setting that aside, um, 
shouldn't we also talk about the fact that pension funds seems to be a rather stupid idea as a whole? If we think about it, just on the basis of what Harvey was talking about yesterday, think about the reduction in time and space that he mentioned, right? So we're basically told that instead of just simply being provided for, for by society, we work. Part of the work we do gets set aside, gets commodified, turned into financial instruments and this type of stuff, and is then reintroduced to the economy. So we're basically competing with a mirror image of the economy, which sits in our own space where we actually you know, do stuff. And you look at the size of the Chilean one, which you mentioned is 79% of GDP. That sits there in the existing Chilean economy, representing the future while inflating asset prices and making things more difficult for ourselves. Isn't it a bit of a runaway Frankenstein monster in a lot of senses? It just strikes me that we should abolish it rather than try to reinvent it. Thank you. Thank you, Constantine. That's a, that's a strong but a very pertinent uh, statement uh, and position. So I've seen uh, another person over there and then I've seen Sean. Who was the person? Yeah, please. Please, can you come over here? Thank you. Um, I'm Sylvia from Austrian Chamber of Labor. I have just one question, just uh, connecting to the, the last uh, question or comment because I think he's completely right. and. In Austria, we have a different system. We have social security pension and no pension funds. It's just a very small part. So I agree totally it's the wrong way. But you can't change the system as quick as, uh, as, as you should, or even it's not possible because of political reasons. But I have one question. How big is the share of national investment in infrastructure, in Canadian infrastructure within, uh, by Canadian pension funds and uh, the same with the Netherlands uh, pension fund because if you invest in your own infrastructure maybe it's easier to get control so that's just a question I don't know I'm not an expert thank you, thank you. last but very last question uh, firstly thanks to the speakers I thought they were all fantastic um, it's developing a theme I think is what would a social ownership of pensions look like do we have alternative models, can we see workers' pensions being invested for public good, not shareholders, and also thinking about the future, how we, th we have to reorganise work to address climate change, how does that, is that going to work? Yeah. So thank you for these very important and difficult questions to tackle in such a short time. What I'm going to do, I'm going to do a reverse tour, so that we end with Kevin. But again, I'm really sorry. I thought we could have a little bit of a margin, but it seems we don't. Um, so uh, be concise, but give us your strong points uh, on, on, these, uh, on these key questions. And please continue the conversation afterwards. Fernando. Thank you. Um, well, for, from, a, from my perspective, uh, yeah, more than thinking about give back, give back money to people, which is funda a fundamental claim and a uh, first step. I really believe that we have to change our conception of, of making profit and doing business with this. In the end, we live in a, in a globalized world. Uh, we are all connected. Uh, and in that sense, we have to stop uh, thinking locally, uh, but to internalize that the consequences of our privilege, because that, that's the word, our privilege, have a impact on other geographies. Um, and I am part of that critique. Uh, I am agree that uh, we have to think in, in other kind of systems, not only in terms of the, the social impact or the accumulation of wealth, but for the unsustainable future that we are building. I think that's the most important thing. Uh, the, the world is not going to uh, work forever if we continue. Thank you very much. So pensions for people, not for profit. Yosi, what do you say? Well, I think that that's what it's all about. Uh, as I, when I started, I already said, well, it's, it's not only the, the high returns that count, it's more than that that count. Um, and um, I, don't know, it's, it's, I don't know if that's an answer, but I really believe that if we... Uh, I believe in pension funds, but I also believe in uh, putting the money in a, uh, away in a in responsible way. And in that way, you have to get uh, control of the pension funds, so that really needs to have this discussion about how your governance d does look like, and uh, it's also very important to get the uh, a very strict relationship with your asset manager. I'm happily to have it in house, 
So I, I'm, I, I'm the boss, not I, uh, we are the boss of our asset managers, so they have to do what we want them to do. And I think that's, a, that's really part of our uh, success. And it's not, that's not always the solution, but being very strict on that and being uh, very notably uh, as a board towards your asset manager makes it uh, very um, uh, worthwhile. And keep on listening to your beneficiaries. Uh, uh, for the others and NGOs, I always tell them, keep nagging us. Keep nagging the pension funds and the boards and tell us what we do wrong. And that's the only way to move. Not the only way, but a very good way to move forward. Sorry. I'm, 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 we just had a, a point of view that we should uh, divest, and he knows that ABP is not divesting <laughs> from yeah. fossil fuel. I mean, I, I know we many keep on talking about that. We have a big discussion yeah. with him. Yes. A couple of weeks about that. Oh, you know each other. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Daria, the honest answer to your question is I don't know. Um, and I'm interested in some of the views that have been put about. But what, what I do think is that, as a general rule, the more we can get workers to be, for example, member nominated trustees of pension schemes, the more worker um, involvement we can have in pension schemes, the likelihood it is, is that better decisions, better influence, leverage can be, can be brought against uh, pension schemes and the way they invest those funds. Yeah, I would completely agree. I'd also say, of course, don't like my conclusion was don't um, invest in other people's privatization, and I, and I think this is the point we really have to stress. But like Sean also outlined, you know, we have to also not stop there, but then say, okay, where should the investments go? Like, you know, what what is needed in our world, and 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 we have talked a lot about. Um, Pub, the financing of public services, and, and we all know that a lot of investment is needed, you know, so, and there's a big role to play for ethical investment, and I think we can use this to creatively think about it. But I would say, to take a step back, that also means, like, we can only tell our pension funds that they should not engage in privatization if we know who our pension funds are, mm -hmm. you know? And this, I think, where the trade unions can play a big role in educating the workers about it. You know, what are pension funds? What are they doing? What are they investing in? And uh, how can we make them stop um, in investing in privatizations? And uh, I hope that we see more union activities and learn from the brilliant examples throughout the world where unions have already shown leadership on that. This is, a, of course, the key question is, you know, what do we do about this? Uh, uh, and I will, I have kind of two responses. Uh, maybe I'll start with just uh, uh, picking up on Constantine's original question uh, uh, or proposition and say, I, I am personally, and I won't say on behalf of QP, but for myself, I, I fully agree. I actually think that, uh, especially in the Anglo-American world, but also some other countries, uh, the labor movements took what is, in my view, a wrong turn by allowing the private financialization of retirement. Yes. And as the Austrian uh, intervener pointed out, this was not necessarily, this wasn't required. And in fact, uh, the original model of a social solidarity-based pension system, what we call pay-as-you-go, where current contributors, money can be transferred to current retirees, that's a proven success story, yes. but it doesn't work for the financial markets. <laughs> and so this is, this is the challenge that we have. We've, we, you know, decades ago in Canada and some other countries, the labor movements accepted the pressure to at least partly or fully financialize our retirement. And now we are caught in this difficult problem with you know, all of the consequences, and we have to figure out how do we get out of this. I take the view, and I've written about this in the contradictions of pension fund capitalism, that there is a way to transition from our current financialized model to something that is non-financialized. But of course, this would take a massive political effort. This is not easy. So what do we do in the meantime? And in the meantime, it's very difficult. We, we have, and as you know, Canada has uh, representatives on these pension funds, trade unions like QP, uh, and we, what can we do? What, what, what I advise people is to do, I think, essentially what Jose is saying. We, we have to try to exercise what influence we have and can exercise to get them to, as Vera says, 
Stop investing in privatization. Don't be involved in some predatory investment that's squeezing profit out of out of people's uh, public assets or people in the global south or, or really anywhere where, where you're going to be part of the problem. Uh, but then, of course, this does raise difficult questions. Of, well, well, how can we make these funds that are in the private capitalist financial markets into something that's pro-social, that's, that's not just premised on maximizing uh, extractions and, and, and profits? And that's difficult. This is not, it's not simply a decision that we have to make or that the unions can make, well, we're going to do this now. What does that look like? I, I'll, I'll conclude by saying this. If we are going to do that, I think, in a viable way, my own view is that we, can, is that we actually have to make a break with the private, for-profit financial model and figure out, you know, I'm, I'm not opposed to credit and lending and, and maybe figuring out a way that these kinds of pools could be put to social use, socially positive use, but I would argue that that can't really work within the existing legal and financial structures. We need to make a break and structure things more like, and I'll conclude with this, our original uh, social security pension plan, the Canada pension plan, which is listed now as a major privatizer, the original structure of that plan actually had, did have a small uh, uh, investment system, and what was it doing? It wasn't in the private financial markets at all. That pension fund, which had billions, would lend money at low interest rates to provincial governments to build public infrastructure yep. on a low cost basis. A fabulous model. This was erased in the late 90s by a neoliberal federal government, and the rest is history. So there are models to, that we can go back to, and that's a, we need a, a, the political will. To, uh, to try to get there. Thank you. Let's give a, a strong round of applause to this panel. And so, Kevin, systemic shift, this is what we need. I so. You cannot just uh, uh, change it a bit by bit from within. But I think we need also to continue to talk. And I think this first, uh, uh, this panel here was very important. This is a thorny issue, but if we don't talk about it, we're gonna go nowhere if everyone stays shy and doesn't dare to talk about what's going on. So I would encourage everyone in the room and from the organizations and the funds and the unions we represent to continue to engage in dialogue to move forward. And then I would say, let's make sure that public uh, pension funds and public pension funds in general are part of the strategy uh, of a pro-public uh, future. Let's not leave them out because there's a huge pool of money and we cannot uh, do without them in a way or another. So thank you very much for uh, being here to all and thanks for QP for having organized uh, this very important panel. Thank you, bye. <laughs>